Welcome to the 2020 March Marine Electronics Seminar Series. Today we're going to be talking about Structure Scan. So let's get started. So how does Structure Scan differ from traditional sonar? Traditional sonar can be thought of as a cone. It typically comes in frequencies like 200 kHz, 83, or 50. It creates a circular coverage area on the bottom and creates the arch deformation that we're used to. And again, it measures range and time. The primary thing that it measures on the fish targets is the air bladder. The orientation of the fish generally doesn't matter for the return. That is to say, if the fish is parallel to the boat, it will return the same arch as if it's perpendicular. It also has great range because of the lower frequency. Many transducers can hit 3,000 feet or more. Structure scan, on the other hand, can be thought of as a beam. It's generally fan-shaped and has almost no forward or backward um, depth to the beam. It also comes in much higher frequencies, typically 455, 800, or even 1.2 MHz. Because of the higher frequency, we have a true-to-scale picture of the fish in the water. This can be both an asset and a curse, depending on the range that we're looking at. It's true-to-scale. That means the deeper it is, the smaller the target is going to appear on the screen. Because it's true to scale, and because we're getting complete wraparound picture of the fish, the orientation on the target matters. If the fish is parallel to the boat, we'll see the side profile of the fish. If he's perpendicular, we'll just see a round blob. Because of the higher frequency, we also have a significantly shorter range potential. Generally, you should consider 150 feet to be the deepest that you want to use structure scan frequency. There's a few companies that have managed to get around this limitation, but 150 is a good rule of thumb. So in this top-down view, you can kind of start to see what we're talking about. The yellow circle represents a traditional sonar, a cone on the bottom. Our pink represents our downscan beam. It's barely larger in total width than our traditional sonar, and quite a bit narrower in front and back dimensions. The two green beams are our side scan beams going out either side of the vessel, and they can have incredibly long side ranges. Some of the side scans that we've been on the water with have seen targets up to 500 feet away from the boat, but most of the time you're going to want to keep a much tighter range than that, even if your transducer is capable of it. We'll cover that a little bit more later. To get started, let's look at the same object in a couple of different views. We're going to start with traditional sonar. You can see a couple of small fish right off of a terrain object. We'll know that this is a rock pile from a later view. You can also see a couple of bass hiding in the shadow of it and an old water pipe right on the bottom. But because we're looking at signal strength, it's not immediately clear what some of the structure is, though we can fairly easily identify the fish targets. Next, we're going to look at that same target in the downscan view. The small fish are barely visible on the screen as a dark brown color. The rock pile is very evident what it is and we can very clearly see the size of the large bass that it's a larger target than the small fish. If you'll remember the previous view, we may have assumed the small fish were larger than the bass just based on their signal return. You can also see the old water pipe. I find whenever I go over something and I'm not quite sure what I'm looking at, downscan is the answer. When you don't know what's under you, it never hurts to flip on your downscan beam and take a look at it. It's almost like an underwater camera. And finally, we're looking at the same object in our side scan. And now we really get a good idea of what's going on under the boat. We also see some objects that we missed with the previous views. It's much harder to see the small fish, though we can still see the bass on the bottom as we pass right over him. We can also see several fish further out to the side that we would have missed otherwise. And we can tell, get a general idea of the hardness or slope of the ground to either side of the vessel. We can clearly see the old pipe now on this view, as well as an old piling that was hiding behind the shadow of the rock pile. Pretty cool, huh? So let's talk briefly about reading the return. Brighter returns are closer or harder or more perpendicular to the transducer. Darker returns are further or softer or sloped away from the transducer. In both cases, we're looking at the amount of energy returned to the transducer. And remember, fish are true to scale. I've often had customers bring in screenshots that were at 250 foot range and show me the big fish that they were seeing. 
at that range, what they were looking at was probably a boulder. That's why it's important to pick a range and grow comfortable with what the scale that you're looking at is. Looking at the screenshot from the previous slide, note how it's getting darker towards the right hand edge of the screen. This indicates we're probably on a slope, although if you were in a flat bottomed lake it could also indicate a softer bottom. Given the consistent decrease in color to the right hand side though, this is probably a slope. Using a 3D transducer would tell us for sure. So let's learn how to read the side scan beam. I find it useful if you think about it like taking your traditional sonar and rotating it 90 degrees counterclockwise. Now is at the top center of the screen and the furthest point in the past is at the bottom center of the screen. The white line you see down the center of the screen is the travel of the boat. The black line or black area mirrored to either side is the vertical water column directly under the boat. Longer shadows indicate that an object is taller, like the rock that you see in the picture here. You can think of it like shining a flashlight beam from the side of the boat, and as it strikes that object, the longer it, the shadow it casts, the taller up that object is. And remember, brighter returns are stronger signals, darker returns are weaker signals. You can see what a hump looks like based on the decreasing depth as we go up towards that rock pile. So let's refresh what structure scan beam views are. They're very narrow with wide range. They're very high resolution because of their higher frequency. There's almost no target distortion on most targets. In some really cool cases, you almost get a picture of the fish. You're able to scan large areas of water relatively quickly. This is particularly useful when you're scouting unknown water like you're pre-fishing for a tournament and you're trying to locate where the humps and rock piles are. Its effective speed is between a half mile an hour and 10 miles an hour and side scan in particular is more effective if you can maintain a steady heading. My recommended speed for using structure scan is between 1 mile an hour and 6 miles per hour to ensure optimal targets. So let's look at some of the common structure scan frequencies. We'll start with the 800 kilohertz down scan beam. And again, these beam sizes are based on the standard measurement for the frequencies. At 800 kilohertz, we have an approximately 45 degree beam width. The pros of this are very high resolution, very sharp shadows, and a photo-like um, bottom. Some of the disadvantages, of course, are the inverse of what we saw before. It's a smaller coverage area, and it has a very shallow range because of the higher frequency. Next, we'll look at the 455 kilohertz downscan beam. The beam width is approximately 70 degrees. It has a medium resolution and a wider coverage area. It's pretty comparable to our 83 kilohertz for beam width. Because of the wider beam, just like with 83 kilohertz, we have more noise in the water, and it's very hard to spot fish. That's one of the reasons why I think the fish reveal capability that Lawrence came out with a couple years ago is so cool. It's still shallow ranged, approximately 150 feet is about as deep as I would get it, although manufacturers claim much deeper range. Again, if a manufacturer tells you 300 feet, I'd like to round down by about 2. On our 800 kilohertz side scan beam, our beam width is 130 degrees. Generally speaking, I'm not a huge fan of the 800 kilohertz or 1.2 megahertz frequencies for side scan because of their incredibly short range. The 1.2 MHz in particular only has about a 60 foot um, throw range to it. It does however give us the highest resolution and the sharpest shadows, so if you're looking for suspended fish, these can still be excellent frequencies to be in. I think that's part of the reason why with the Mega technology and the UHD from Garmin, companies are playing around with the 1.2 MHz frequency spectrum. I just hope they don't give up too much side range. 100 foot, 100 foot is roughly what we're looking for. The 455 kilohertz side scan has a beam width of approximately 170 degrees. This is my favorite fire and forget mode. It can be sometimes difficult to spot fish, but with a sharp eye and the newer active 3 in 1 or Mega Plus transducers, you can still do it. It also has a fantastic throw range and has a very minimal dead spot in the water. We'll talk about the beam dead spot a little bit later. 
but the beam dead spot is one of the primary complaints I have against the higher frequencies as it increases the area that isn't covered by the side scan beam. Let's talk briefly about the difference between range and lateral distance. Remember, sonar measures range. It's the R in sonar. Like in my previous seminar, if you remember nothing else from this seminar, remember range. Range is not the same thing as your lateral distance unless the target is directly at the shore. That's the same as with traditional sonar, where range is not the same thing as depth unless you pass directly over the target, except now we're looking sideways instead of down. So let's play around with side scan with this hypothetical example. But first, let's familiarize ourselves with the typical Lorentz screen. In the top left, you have your overlay data in this example, and right now we're showing the current depth and temperature at the boat. On the bottom left-hand screen, you have the pop-up box that indicates information about the cursor. Specifically, the white line, what the depth was at that point, what the temperature was, and how far we are currently from the vessel. Remember, this is from where the transducer was at that horizontal line, so the 50.7 foot depth that we're measuring is from the white center line to the bottom, not necessarily the depth at the target itself. On our right hand uh, screen, right next to our vertical line, you'll see how far that vertical line is from the center line of the boat. This is measuring our range. Specifically, it's measuring 73.6 feet in the current example, and we're going to assume that we have a fish target on this shelf. So let's look at the previous example from a different view. Please pardon the bad art. So as you can see, the depth of the water under the transducer is 50.7 feet. The fish is at 30 feet, and the range to the target is 73.6 feet. So how far do you think the fish is from the boat? The fish is 67 feet laterally from the boat. A common mistake many people make when reading side scan is they think the 73.6 feet to the left is the lateral distance x. Remember, sonar measures range and it has no way of knowing how deep the target is. Another common mistake that I've seen people make is to think that the range, 73.6 feet, is the fish depth, 30 feet, plus x. In this particular case, that would be 97 feet, or that somehow y1 plus y2 plus x equals r. Both would be true only if either our y variable was zero or our x variable was zero. This is the same as passing directly over the target. So what does this mean? Much like with traditional sonar, where the target will never be deeper than you measure, with side scan, the target may be closer than you measure with the transducer. The shallower you are, the less this matters. So let's look at the previous example, but this time we're in 10 feet of water with our fish at 5 feet. We'll maintain the range to target at 73.6 feet. So how far away laterally do you think the fish is from the boat? The answer is 73.4 feet. In this shallow water example, x and r are very close to the same thing. This is probably the reason why many bass fishermen don't really understand range when it comes to side scan, and we hear all kinds of different things about what you're actually measuring on the screen. It can largely be ignored for shallow depths, but as you get deeper, particularly as you get into 50 or 60 feet of water, or walleye depths, it starts to come into play rather significantly. Remember, targets we mark on the bottom are always closer than you measure with the transducer. Treat mark structure on scouting runs with the side scan beam as in the general area. You really want to get closer and use a high frequency like 800 kilohertz to measure and get a more accurate mark on the target. The bigger the range and depth, the less are accurate the marks. So let's talk a little bit about the sonar dead zone. This is the area above your side scan beam. The lower the frequency, the smaller this dead zone will be. The higher the frequency, the larger this dead zone area will be. In the above example, we have an 800 kilohertz beam, a 455 kilohertz beam, and I've got three targets. The green fish shows up in both frequencies. 
the orange fish would only show up in 455, and the red fish is too shallow for either beam to pick up. The dead zone area is one of the reasons why I personally prefer 455 kilohertz for my side scan beam, even though it makes it more challenging to spot fish due to the weaker shadows. I use contrast to make up for this, and with the active 3-in-1 Mega Plus or the new Garmin UHD transducers, the issue is largely resolved at these lower resolutions. So how do you know if you're looking at a fish or a rock? Well, if it's a fish, the shadow will not be directly adjacent to the target. If the shadow is separated from the target, you know that target is up off the ground. If the shadow is right next to that target, you know the target is right on the ground. The closer the shadow is to the target, the closer that object is to the ground. We have a couple of examples. To make things easier, we've used the same range for every target and put them in different spots of the sonar beam. First, let's look at the fish on the left side of the beam, fish A and B. These are outside our depth range and so will be marked over the bottom. In the case of fish B, the shadow is quite close to the target. In the case of fish A, the shadow is quite a long distance away from the target. Now let's look at two targets on the right hand side of the screen, fish C and D. In this case, the range of the targets is less than our depth range, so they will be painted in the black vertical section of the water column. Again, the shadow for fish D being higher up in the water column is further away from the target. Fish C's shadow is so close to the target that we can't actually see it as it's in the downscan beam. In this particular example, I put a brick on the bottom and we drove right over it. Because we drove right over it, we split the brick in half and we put one half on one side of the screen and one half on the other. My apologies for getting a bit tongue-tied there and hopefully my art wasn't too bad. Take a moment and look at it. You can't always see the shadows, but if you can ever identify the shadow and the target and they're not together, that tells you definitively that that target is up off the surface. So unless you're fishing for floating boots, it's almost certainly a fish target. If the shadow is directly adjacent to the target, that target's on the bottom. It doesn't necessarily mean it's not a fish, but I'd sure lean towards rock in that example. Generally when I'm looking for fish on the side scan beam, I'm looking for oblong shapes of a distinctively bright nature against the background. Typically these look like rice, maggots, or dandruff. It's very important that you set a fixed range so that you get a good intuitive idea of how large those targets are. You want to play with contrast to pop them out. In this example, I'm running the contrast a little bit to the low side, and that's giving me some speckles directly above the rocks to the right hand side of the screen. I don't know for sure that there's some fish near those rocks without zooming in, but it's sure worth a try to go fishing by them, because I know this time of year fish are off box naturally, and I'm seeing a large amount of speckles near those rocks. So what kind of range do I like? Generally if I'm actively looking for suspended fish, as opposed to trying to identify structure, a range between 80 feet and 120 feet is a really good balance. My personal preference is 100 feet. Those of you might have noticed something in the previous example. We passed directly over a target that appears to be just off the bottom in both our side scan and down scan view. There's also some indication that it's not directly on the bottom in our traditional sonar, but it's very, very close to the bottom, so we can't say definitively what it is. There's no way to get any shadow separation given how close it is to the bottom. However, the oblong body and the sizes of the target makes it likely that this is a pike laying right down in the mud, right off this rock pile, right at the edge of a steep slope, waiting to ambush fish. Let's take a moment to look at two other companies' side scan. First, we'll look at the Hummingbird Mega. Actually, they're on the Mega Plus right now. The Mega Plus and the Lorance Active 3-in-1 are both very, very good side scanning transducers, and really it comes down to what your personal preference is. They have nearly equivalent ranges, and nearly equivalent sharpness. We would put Lawrence and Hummingbird as the top right now for side scanning transducers. Garmin just updated their side scanning transducers recently with the UHD, and particularly after the last software patch, they've shown notable improvements in their side scan technology. They're still a little bit behind Lawrence and Hummingbird, 
but they're getting quite a bit sharper. The main flaw in the UHD currently is that it's a 1.2 MHz focused transducer. This means it has a much shorter throw range than the Lorantz. The Lorantz 3D transducer can look sideways up to 500 feet. This is just insane. It means you can scan an entire bay with one pass. But remember, if we're looking for suspended targets, you don't want to be looking 500 feet. You want to be looking about 100 feet. So if looking for suspended targets is what you're after, they're all getting quite good, but Lorantz and Hummingbird still have an advantage. Let's talk briefly about why speed is so important when it comes to structure scan. If you go too slow, you're going to hit the target with multiple beam pulses, which means you're going to stretch that target out along the ground. You're going to end up with the same spaghetti effect that you typically encounter when you're stationary and fish are moving under you with your traditional sonar. As you speed up, you're going to start increasing the gap between pulses and you're going to start missing targets. Eventually, you're not going to be able to paint the bottom and you're going to see distortions in the bottom. It's also important to keep a constant heading to avoid duplication of targets and cutouts in your bottom where the transducer is unable to stitch the bottom together. Remember, the sweet spot is between 1 mile an hour and 6 miles an hour. Color palettes can make a really big difference when it comes to structure scan. Lorance recently enhanced all of their color palettes, and I was forced to change what my favorite color palette was with the improvements that they made in the new color palettes. My current favorite is this number 6, light brown color. I find it's really useful at both shadows and suspended targets. But let's take a look at them. The first one we're going to look at is the red and yellow. This used to be my favorite target for seeing suspended targets, and it's still useful in some situations where we have a very weak bottom, but by and large I find everything that's done in this color palette can also be done in the new number 6 and number 10. This is the Hummingbird Imitation color palette. It does an okay job, but my personal preference is number 6. This is the number 10 color palette. It's functionally the same as number 6, and some customers really prefer the blue color compared to the brown. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but dirt should be brown. Contrast is probably the key structure scan capability, and you can think of it like a combination of color line and sensitivity. It allows you to tease suspended targets away from the bottom. If you're looking for suspended targets, you should be adjusting your contrast almost continually, trying to look for those dandruff or rice shapes. You want to start quite low so that the entire picture is relatively dark. In this case, we're starting at auto minus 34. Next, we bump it up a little bit, and we get to auto minus 18. Again, we're looking for these bright rice or dandruff shapes, and there's a couple starting to emerge. As we get up to auto minus 8, we see several likely fish targets in all areas of the screen, particularly in the suspended water column and along the edge of the shelf. At auto minus 3, we see even more targets, but we're starting to pick up enough rocks that some of the targets are vanishing into the underlying bottom. At auto plus 8, we've lost almost all targets, but we've picked up a few more targets in the suspended area of the water column. When you're in open water where you don't have a good image on the bottom, sometimes running the contrast artificially high can tease out some targets to the side of the boat where you have a weak signal return. I prefer always being under the auto sensor, but it's always water dependent and you should really be playing with it all the time. Now let's look at one of the biggest improvements to the downscan beam, Fish Reveal. It's a technology that I hope all the other companies will copy shortly. It was introduced by Lorance and it's one of the coolest software tweaks we've seen in ages. Basically, it's the reverse of the age-old trick of putting our structure scan on our traditional sonar screen. Instead, we're put putting our traditional sonar on our structure scan. There's quite a bit of math involved though in making sure that we're not rendering things like the trees and the terrain. I find however in fish reveal the auto sensor is quite high. Usually I dial it back and let's take a look at what it looks like as I go backwards uh, from the auto sensor. As you can see my targets are disappearing and I'm left with only the larger targets that are more centered in the beam and are likely to be larger fish, these are the targets I care about. 62 might be a little bit low, but it's going to be water dependent. 
I'm using a number 3 color palette, which gives me an indication of signal strength. Some people like to use a um, primary color palette, like number 1, or one of the orange or green color palettes, if they're just looking to see if there's a target there at all. But the number 3 color palette gives me an indication of signal strength. I really like that. Generally speaking, when it comes to fish reveal, I find that I'm always at least 20 or 30% under the auto sensor. I find the auto sensor is very high. Here's a good example of some large predator fish feeding in a bait ball. You can see with the fish reveal, the predator fish really stand out. Here's an example of traditional sonar and down scan side by side. Note the ball of fish off the right side of the hump in both views. Here's an example from the Lorance simulator. It does a really good job of showing fish in and around trees. Unfortunately, when we went out, it was too early in the year for there to be large amounts of weed growth to look at, and our lakes don't have trees like they appear to have in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And here we have an old riverbed. You can tell the boundary of the riverbed by the light versus dark areas. Really useful information. When it comes to fish finders, you should really take advantage of all your tools. Take advantage of the split screen functionality to have multiple views up at the same time. This can really give you a complete picture of everything that's around you in the water. Here's a good example of a fish striking in both fish reveal and traditional sonar. One of the cool tools that is available to us in Structure Scan is Structure Scan 3D. This gives us the best view of the slope, we're no longer guessing. It's also more accurate for mapping with the overlay view because it has more receive elements than most traditional structure scan and side scanning transducers. It also has just insane range because they've devoted more crystals to the side looking aspect. And of course it's really, really cool. With Lorance, I really wish they'd add a attitude heading roll sensor to their structure scan 3D like Ray Marine did. I have to say, Raymarine's Structure Scan 3D is the best right now, and it works really well. I just wish Raymarine's Side Scan Beam was as good as Lorance or Hummingbirds, or even Garmin's. It used to be pretty close, but we haven't seen very many improvements in the Side Scan capability from Raymarine recently, though their Down Scan is quite good. Here's a good example of a bridge when viewed in the Lorance 3D. And a bait ball in 3D. Here's a picture recorded in 3D going over a dry riverbed, note the schools of fish, around the boat. One of the problems that we have with 3D, particularly the Lorance 3D, is because of the higher resolution and the fact that it marks every target, occasionally you can end up with motor thrust appearing in the signal. That's because the air bubbles from your bow mount travel under the boat and are highly likely to be encountered by the 3D beam. Typically, we set our sensitivity quite low in order to avoid that, and then dial up just to the point before those air bubbles start appearing. This, however, causes us to potentially lose some targets. I really wish we could exclude any target mark within the top five feet, as I probably don't care about these. This is a good example of the Raymarine RX-1000 transducer with their uh, attitude heading roll sensor on it. It does a really phenomenally amazing job. The addition of this heading roll sensor means we typically don't encounter the air bubble problem that we have with the Lorance, and it also gives us the ability to indicate fish targets either by depth or by size with different coloring on the orbs. We also get a very good bottom map, roughly equivalent to Lorance, at a slightly lower resolution with a higher terrain hump accuracy. This is the Garmin RealView 3D Historical. It was a really interesting attempt at the technology, and we were never able to get it quite working right on the boats that we tested it on. I really am still hoping for a Gen 2, because in addition to the 3D Historical, Garmin played around with a 3D Realtime. 3D Realtime was amazing, it just didn't work particularly well. If they can get the bugs worked out of it, it would be a game changer when it comes to fishing. When we're talking about historical structure scan, we also need to talk about the Hummingbird 360. This is historical, but with the high rotational spin speed of the Hummingbird 360, particularly with their new 360 Mega, 
it's approaching the real time that we see with the Lorentz and Garmin transducers that we'll talk about in the next seminar. We do still view it as a historical transducer though because it is taking a typical side scan beam and rotating it at a fixed rotational rate to paint the picture. So let's take a look at some live structure scan video. First thing we typically do is we lower the contrast a little bit. And the reason we're doing this is we're looking for um, those uh, rice or maggot shaped targets and we're trying to resolve them out at the bottom. You can see as I dial it up, just south of that rock pile to the right, we're seeing a cluster of snow or rice shapes um, showing up on the screen. I see a bright to soft transition there, so we've got a slope. And it appears that right off that slope, we likely have some, some suspended fish. Here's a rock pile that we used in a previous example. Let's take a little closer look at it. I'm just playing with my contrast again, trying to resolve any potential fish targets that are around this rock pile. Let's look at them blue. For in a highlight palette, this can be useful sometimes with a little bit higher contrast. This uh, spot where some suspended fish targets might be that we might have otherwise missed. Here's one to the right. And there's a likely fish target right there and a fantastic fish target directly north of that. You can see the shadow. Super cool when you can see the shadow of a fish. Looks like a likely bass laying pretty close to right on the bottom there. This dark line on the screen is the edge of a shelf just to the right of the screen. Huh, interesting target. Looks like he's up off the bottom. I think I'll use that as a screen in one of my uh, seminars. And here we have a bass that we passed just about directly over. Note the size difference between those two targets indicates a bigger versus a smaller fish. And there's that same bass in the downscan and our suspected pike. Got a school of fish right off this rock, and again we're looking for the dandruff or rice shapes. Note these large shadows out to the side. These indicate taller objects out to the side of the boat on the port side. Cool underutilized tool is the overlay on top of the chart. I run this pretty frequently because you can miss stuff. When you're looking at it on the chart, you have a large historical view of everything around the boat. I usually use a blue color palette in this particular case with a little bit lower contrast ratio. I think the brown is more effective, but when I'm looking at a chart I typically like the blue because water should be blue. And again, just like before, I like a little bit lower on the contrast scale. Remember, with structure scan, objects may be closer than you see on the chart, but they'll never be further away. You still get a very good idea of everything around the boat. There's a couple of logs laying on the bottom there. And a fish hiding in that rock pile.
let's switch to a side scan view. While the overlay is nice, the side scan is a higher resolution than you can get with the overlay, just because we don't have as much processing power for the overlay. And again, there's some dandruff for snow shapes right next to that rock pile, so we've got some fish on that structure. Here we've got a spiny rock ridge that we're passing right over, right on the edge of a slope. We can see the edge of the slope with a dark background. Let's switch to another uh, video recording. In this particular case, we're near some docks, looking at some water pipes. Got the fish reveal turned on on a downscan beam on my left hand side and we're looking right with the side scan um, on the right hand screen. And you can see why I really like the number 6 color palette. It does a fantastic job at both shadows and suspended targets. Got quite a few old dock pilings and uh, water pipes in the water here. There's a pretty good indication that we've got a decent amount of fish targets out to the right hand side of the screen. We don't know for sure until we get closer to them, but there's enough right along the soft spot that it's worth investigating. So dial my contrast up just a hair. You'll notice how we picked up some rice shapes uh, showing up a little bit to the starboard side of the boat. Right along that rock pile. Let's switch to the 3D mode so we can get a good idea of that slope, just to determine if that darker spot to the starboard side was a uh, downward facing slope or a soft spot on the bottom. In this particular case, it looks like we might actually have a little bit of a shelf there to the starboard side. So that was probably the top surface of that slight shelf. We're getting less energy return because we have less of the beam that's returning to the transducer from that shelf area. I like to start with a very low sensitivity on my structure scan 3D, and then I dialed up a little bit until I just start to pick up uh, the motor wash, and then I back off. Typically I'm in the minus 30 to minus 37 uh, range when I'm spotting uh, fish targets. And there we go. It looks like we're picking up a couple of fish in the water that we were previously marking with the side scan. Here's what that same view looks like with traditional sonar, down scan, and side scan put together. Pretty cool, huh? Thank you for watching the 2020 March Marine Structure Scan Seminar. I hope you enjoyed and maybe learned a thing or two. Good luck fishing out there.